But there's a space in a lot of businesses, and sometimes it can come after five years, sometimes it may be 10 years in, where you just get a little bit blur with the whole thing. Really, is this it? Is this my life? Is this all I'm going to be doing? And that's a position that I find a number of people through the 10 or 12 years, more than that, that I've been in this industry. I do find people that have been going for quite a while, but they get to a point where they're just thinking, what's next? How do I stay excited in this business? How's it going, everyone? Welcome to the Fitness Founders Podcast. I'm Kevin Mannion, VP Marketing here at Glowfox. This week, we talked to Robert Gerrish, who works with small business owners to fine tune, grow, and exit their businesses. He founded the Flying Solo Online Community, co wrote the best selling book of the same name, and in mid 2018 released his latest book, The One Minute Commute. He's a podcaster, speaker, and works one on one with established and aspiring entrepreneurs. Okay, let's have a listen. Robert, welcome to the show. Kevin, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Now, you're, you're famous for creating and I think eventually selling um, a community that you called Flying Solo. Um, can yes. you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, uh, the danger here, I must tell you, Kevin, is that is once you start me going through my story, you, you might have to interrupt me and tell me to stop. You've got lots of time, don't worry. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, look, Flying Solo was a business that um, I started um, down here in Australia. So I'm talking to you from Sydney. Uh, I'm originally uh, from London, but I came came to live in Sydney about 25 years ago. And I came here after a sort of marketing career um, in London with a small agency. And I came here uh, to Australia with a view to designing a different way of working. I was I'd, I'd uh, I was pretty burnt out by the time I arrived in Australia, and uh, and I wanted to work in a different way. So what I found when I got here is that an awful lot of people here, and it's the same indeed throughout most of Europe, throughout the US, an awful lot of people work by themselves in what uh, I think of as a lifestyle business, but it's not, you know, often when you use the phrase lifestyle business, you see these images of people lying in hammocks with their laptops and all these totally unrealistic sort of images. But in fact, in Australia, what there is, because, you know, the climate's on our side and there's lots of, you know, benefits in um, to be to be living and working, I guess, in this environment, there are a lot of people that are running businesses that are really closely designed to suit how they want to live. And that was exactly where I was when I arrived here. And I thought, that's what I want to be doing. I want to design a business. You know, I, I'd recently met my my now wife of 20, 20 or more years. We wanted to start a family. So I knew I wanted to build a business that was really going to suit our life. So um, as I sort of got into that space and started thinking about that, I, that's when I realized just how many other people were doing it. But also what little support and uh, any sense of community there was around these people. They were all lone individuals building little businesses, but didn't sort of come together anyway. And this was this was in the late 1990s when the internet was only really just kind of starting. We didn't have blogs, we didn't have forums, but we did have things called portals, you know, which were very clunky mm -hmm. sort of places where, where people shared content. So I, I had always loved writing. So I, I kind of started writing and, and developed a little thing that sort of turned into a portal almost accidentally. Um, very soon after, I was approached by a publisher who saw my work and said, would I write a book? And then I was a published, uh, approached by a TV crew who were doing a big documentary on new work. So all this thing kind of, I realized I was onto something because as soon as as soon as I got sort of seen a bit, um, you know, the publicity just started almost automatically. So uh, being a you know, marketing man, uh, I thought, okay, well, I'm clearly onto something here. So I registered the name Flying Solo and I started this online community that over the next dozen or more years uh, grew into a big, a biggish business down here in Australia. So we had 120,000 members, um, a number of people in all walks of life. We had a lot of people within the sort of fitness industry, whether they be individual trainers and practitioners, yoga instructors and so on, um, to people that were actually running a small studio themselves and were looking to grow that. So um, that's kind of what I did. And during the course of that, I then got quite involved with the fitness industry. I was approached to run some workshops for a, a big event down here called Filex, which some yep. of your members may be aware of. So I, I presented uh, and ran workshops at, at that event for a number of years. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of what it moved into. So that's really 
I guess most of the last uh, sort of 12 or 15 years of my life is dedicated to helping people build small businesses that really suit the way they want to live. So I'm all for growth and expansion and, and all of those things. But I think at the core of the work that I do is making sure that the person that runs the business is living the way they want to be living. That's what kind of drives me is to help people create really effective, uh, enjoyable businesses. Okay. And you, you, you gather the community of more than 100,000 entrepreneurs. Um, what yep. was it that drew these people together? What kind of problems does everybody okay, have? Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Well, look, it's interesting because we, we, uh, we ran research, uh, quite extensive research every couple of years with the community. And, um, and sadly, every time we ran it, we ran it about eight times whilst I was there. Um, the challenges were the same and the order of the challenges were the same. So okay. these, are, these are kind of etched in my mind. So the first and most constant challenge for people running a small business is having enough clients and having enough money. So the two obviously go very hand in hand. So clients, finding clients, retaining clients, that's absolutely the number one hot button. Now, bear in mind that uh, the the community that we grew was uh, a majority of those people were um, in the sort of professional services. So they were selling services, be that training, personal fitness, yep. des design, writers, all those kind of things, more so than they were selling widgets or products. So, but number one hot button is finding enough clients and making enough money in your business. So that was number one. The second one was uh, wearing too many hats. So trying to do everything. Now, obviously, when you're in a very small business, that's, you know, to some extent that kind of comes with the territory, but it doesn't have to be like that. So overwhelm is, is really number two. People were just finding they had so many things to do that they just weren't able to do anything or didn't sense or feel that they were really getting to what were the priorities in their business. And I think since the growth and rise of social media, so many things that distract us and pull us away, uh, you know, some of them very usefully, but occasionally they take these kind of suck our time. They take us away from where we need to be. So that was number two. Number three is actually very closely related is t kind of time management and having enough hours in the day to do the work you need to be doing. So a lot of people running a small business are running around somewhat like headless chickens is an expression that uh, is used a great deal. Um, you know, just putting out fires, responding to things, um, not working efficiently and effectively. So clearly two and three are, are quite close together. Uh, the fourth point is actually getting the business model right you know, is, is actually um, really making sure that what you've got works. You know, a lot of businesses uh, are still very much in the kind of peaks and troughs type area, you know, where business is good one month, it's quiet the next month. And it, it is a lot of businesses run like that. So kind of ironing out the troughs, getting things to be much more constant and viable, that was the kind of the, the, the fourth hot button. And, um, you know, from there, it goes into a whole lot of other lists. But those are the four that okay. dominated. Sounds um, like you, know, uh, you're, you, you haven't forgotten those. They've been well ingrained in your mind. <laughs> I'm afraid they have. <laughs> and, you know, no matter what we do, uh, that, that's still largely the order. Marketing, marketing, marketing yeah. is, is pretty well always number one. You know, it's, and does that relate to your knowledge of, you know, you clearly have a very specialist knowledge within your industry. Would you say that uh, those, those sort of correlate fairly closely? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I would say number one. People I talk to, number one thing is getting customers and, and keeping customers. Yeah. It's it's like the yeah. formula for growth. And um, I definitely want to um, pick your brains in a little bit more detail on those. Um, sure. But I noticed you've actually just started a new podcast. Um, Indeed. Called, I think it's Rekindle. And it's yes. focused on how to stay focused and energized in business. Um, so tell yes. me, why did you move on to that topic or what makes you passionate about that? Yeah. Okay, well, look, part of it, uh, to some extent, Kevin, I suppose, is, you know, is kind of where I am now in my own life. So, you know, I'm, I'm now in my early 60s. I've, I've built a business, absolutely adored every day of running and growing that business. And I've now exited that business. And so now I find myself at a point, you know, where I'm, I'm, I don't want to grow another big business. That's kind of not my goal. But what I'm, so I kind of look around, I go, well, what's the, what's the one thing that it's still within so much of this space that I love so much, this small business space. What's the one thing that I that I see time and again? And 
Um, and it didn't take me long to realize that there's this kind of middle space, if you like, when a business, when you've pretty well got the business model just about right. You kind of, you know what you're doing. You know how to do this thing. Um, you've been doing it in many cases for probably a little while, you know, so it's a business that you know, it's something that you're not going to walk away from anytime soon because it's what you know, it's what you do. But there's a space in a lot of businesses and sometimes it can come after five years, sometimes it may be 10 years in where you just get a little bit blur with the whole thing. Like, really, is this it? Is this my life? Is this all I'm going to be doing? And that's a, a, a position that I find a number of people through the 10 or 12 years, more than that, that I've been in this industry. I do find people that have been going for quite a while, but they get to a point where they're just thinking, you know, kind of what's next? How do I stay excited in this business? Now, when you're an employee, if you're in that position, you go to your boss and you go, hey, get me another job, move me to a different department, give me another challenge. When you're the business owner, there's no one to go to to, to to kind of have that conversation. So that's really what Rekindle is all about. I'm talking to people that are in, have either been through that kind of scenario or are in that scenario and finding out what do they do to stay energized, focused and on track. Because I think when I look at, um, at sort of business failure, and you know, you would you would know Kevin as, as well as anyone listening, that there is unfortunately a, a high incidence of business failure. It's nowhere near as high as yeah. a lot of people talk about, but it, it does happen. And often, when businesses fail, they don't fail in some spectacular financial implosion. Often, when a business fails, it's just because it gets too hard, and the business owner thinks, you know what? I think I'd rather go and get yeah. a job than in this yeah that's why and that's that pains me greatly kevin that's that's really why i started rekindle and why i've started this new focus is i don't want people to fall out of love with their business because it's still the business they fell in love with so the 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 we shouldn't i don't believe is you know i suppose there are parallels with relationships and marriages you know let's rather than running away from things let's fix it up Let's remind ourselves why we got here in the first place. Let's look at those things that attracted us. And once you start to look, you'll find that in many cases that actually, you know what, all the things I really love, they're still here. I've just kind of, I've, you know, I, I don't notice them anymore or, or I don't bring them to the fore quite so much. So that's what I'm doing with Rekindle, I hope, over time is I'm speaking to a lot of individuals and I'm learning quite a lot myself about what people do to stay fresh. And, and that, I think, is so important. Maybe let's, for the sake of our listeners, break it down to some of the challenges they may, may be facing in the business. Sure. Um, sure. Cool. Um, so I think, I think what you're saying is certain. It just becomes a little bit stale overall in how you perceive your business and the potential for it. Um, so maybe if we look at that from a, a marketing perspective. Um, sure. Yeah. Where would say if I have a business that's relatively relatively established, um, mm -hmm. where might I be? You know falling off track or losing focus when it comes to marketing? Okay, well look, that's a great opening question. I've got a few things that, uh, I've got a few responses to that. The first thing is, and, and a number of your listeners may well have heard of this, but there was some research done, coincidentally done in, again in Australia by a guy called John Gatorna. Um, and he looked at uh, why people left a business, why customers left a business. So I'm gonna start from perhaps not where you thought I'd start. Um, so. What he, what this guy found through some extensive research that he did, that 68% of people, of customers who leave a business, that is, that is, think of think of it in your industry, that is, um, you know, members who <clears throat> who used to come to your gym yep. that don't come Retention. to your gym anymore. Retention. 68% of them leave because of what what he termed as perceived indifference. Right, perceived indifference. Seven out of ten, almost sixty-eight percent of people leave a business because of perceived indifference. What that means is they're leaving because they think that you don't care. They think the business actually doesn't really care about them very much. Now, whether those figures, if you did a, if you ran that research just within the fitness industry, I suspect it would be there would be a different figure. It might not be sixty-eight percent because I suspect that you know there are other personal factors why a member of a gym or a member of a yoga studio stops going and it's sometimes not so much to do with perceived indifference but it's you know lethargy and drive in the individual you know it will also play a large part but i do think it's interesting 
And I think we should all learn from this that so many customers leave because they think that as business owners that we don't care. Now, if you think of it, you're, sorry, you're about to say something. No, I was just going to ask. No. Um, yeah, like what would be some examples in a, okay. in a fitness business of okay. maybe something people aren't thinking about that could be leaving a, a, ba a bad impression with their customers? Okay. That's a great question. So look, I'll give you an example. And um, okay, let's use the, uh, I was going to go to a cafe example, but let's use a fitness industry one. Right. So for many, many years, I used to go to a small um, fitness studio up the road from where I live. Now, I stopped going. And in hindsight, now I can look at it and I can say, actually, you know what, the reason I stopped going actually was because of perceived indifference. Now, this is a very small studio, Kevin. So this is probably not um, you know, representative of a large number of your customers. This was a, a studio that had maybe four or five trainers. I uh, can't remember how many cubic feet it was, but anyway, quite a small studio. Now, why did I stop going? I stopped going because uh, I got into the fitness habit, which is kind of as an individual, that's what I wanted. But I think my trainer basically got a bit bored with seeing me, you know, and that's that's what I feel. And when I went there, I noticed that, you know, when the first time I used to go there, mm. I got a nice warm reception. I, my my kind of program for the day was all nicely worked out. The equipment was all nice and clean. The music was nicely considered. And then little by little, maybe over the course of a couple of years, uh, it wasn't quite like that. It was when I walked in there, the approach from my trainer was more kind of, you know, you know what to do. So you get started over there. I'll be with you in a minute. What did he do? Went and sat in the corner on his phone. You know, so little things like that. Now, that's actually quite a noticeable thing. But I think it's detail where people, when they first join somewhere, and you think of a new business, you know, when you walk in, all the staff are smiling at you. People turn around the minute you walk in the door. They don't stand huddled in some kind of conversation behind the counter. When you walk into a studio, uh, a trainer might be overworking with someone else, but she or he will still smile at you and, and kind of welcome you with their eyes and their face. These, these are the sort of things that if you're not careful, they, they stop happening because we just we get used to the business and we get used to the customers and we don't care quite as much. The water bubbler maybe isn't filled up quite as much as it is. The showers and the, and the, you know, the bathrooms <clears throat> aren't cleaned quite as regularly. It's little bits of detail that just get people get into the habits, that is the business owners and the staff, just get a little bit too comfortable and a little bit into a habit. Now, that's often the thing that can happen in a business. You know, and the thing uh, that really bugs the hell out of me, and I spoke, speak to a number of people about this, is when you walk in somewhere and you're standing sort of at the counter on the reception area and no one, it doesn't, you know, like, does any, can anybody see me? Have I turned invisible? You know, this is the kind of the greeting, the welcome the thank you for making it into this studio on this cold, wet, miserable day. You know, it's making them feel, hey, you're here. We, it's the greeting, the welcome, and the detail that is so important. And those are the little things that um, eat away at a customer. And if they're kind of losing a little bit of their own resolve, which a lot of people do clearly within the fitness industry as, as a customer, if their resolve is getting a bit weaker and then they start to think, you know, I don't think these people would notice if I came or if I didn't. You know, it's not hard to see that that can uh, result in people leaving. And also, we, we've got now, you know, fiercely competitive businesses. You know, you might have a Pilates studio, mm -hmm. but next door, you know, 200 meters down the road, there might be a yoga studio. Yep. Lots and of choice. You know, absolutely lots of choice. And the chances are the new people are just that little bit bouncy, a little bit smiley, a little bit more polished than you are because you've been doing it for a while so that's one of the key things and i think what we should do as business owners and not just in our own industry but go and have a look at the people that have really got customers flocking in what are they doing you know go and walk into an apple store just go and look at the way see the way that staff greet you and smile at you and welcome you Look at those things. Go to a cafe that's popular and then go to a cafe that's unpopular and just sit there and work out what's the difference. The chances are it's nothing to do with the coffee. It's more to do with the ambience, the greeting, the decoration, the sounds, the noise. You know, those are the, it's that detail that keeps customers. Mm -hmm. So many times in business, we think what keeps customers is dropping the price or upping the benefits. You know, I'm sure those things can have a role, but the main people will pay premium. People will pay more if they feel that 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 uh, institution, that that studio, those individuals that work there 
actually care about them. That's the key thing. Okay. And tell me, Robert, when you sit down with somebody in this situation that's yep. not seeing uh, enough growth or you feel things or they feel things are going stale, how, what do you say to them? How, how do you help change their mindset? What are some of the things that you uh, advise them to do? Okay. Well, look, that's that, another good question. One of the foot that, and that scenario you you painted is a is a classic one. You know, where I'll often have someone in front of me who's just feeling flat as a tack. You know, and just, so the opening question I'll usually start with is, where do you get your energy from? Now, when you say that to someone in that position, they will look at you with sort of hangdog eyes and say. I haven't got any energy. I just don't, you know, I don't feel like I've got any energy. I say, okay, let's wind the clock back then to a time when you did, when you were bouncing with energy and you were, you know, you were much more buoyant and upbeat than you are now. Just describe what was going on in your business and in your life at that point. Now, when you ask that question, that really opens the floodgates. Now, I'll talk here more about personal than business for a second, because when you ask a business owner, when was when was it that you had most energy and what were you doing? Often the responses you get are nothing to do with business. Often what you'll you'll hear are things like, oh, when I had lots of energy, I used to play uh, soccer with a bunch of mates every weekend. I'd go out with my wife for dinner at least once a week or to the movies. Um, I'd catch up with friends every couple of weeks. We'd go on bike rides. You know, all these sort of activities start to come come out. Um, but when we start to get under the pump, what we tend to do is we stop doing the very things that give us energy. And that's that's the killer. Once once we stop doing those good things and we fall into that trap of thinking, okay, business is a bit tough, so I need to stay at work longer. I need to stare at my computer longer. I need to stare at my figures longer. You know, that's not the right solution. What we need to do is business owners, if we want to maintain the energy to run our businesses and re-energize our businesses, then we have to energize ourselves. You know, and it's quite ironic, I think, that within the sort of the fitness industry, you know, to think that anybody in that industry can be, you know, low on energy. But, you know, we both know, I think, that there are plenty of people that are. The yeah. people at the front desk may, may be all buffed and polished and shiny, but the chances are there's someone in the back room who's, you know, hunched over and, and feeling much less than energetic. So the first question is look at what you're doing in your whole life. What are the, what's the balance of your life like? You know, how, how much are you spending doing fun and recreational things? How much time are you spending with friends and family? How, you know, looking at the makeup of your, of your life, um, that's the place to start. Because often you'll find that the, the business owner who's really kind of struggling with energy and with trying to find solutions to go forwards is the person who is, has almost has isolated themselves. You know, their mates, their friends don't spend time with them because they're boring old gits who just droning on about their struggling business their friends and family don't want to spend much time with them because they're just miserable you know it, it's it's a sad situation but it's often what happens so they end up feeling very isolated and alone and that that's that's not a good situation but it must be very hard to to leave the office in that in that scenario to go and do those fun things uh, how do you convince people to 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 take a chance on that okay well that, that's a good point it it is it is difficult but if the situation is if I've got, I mean, I suppose it's a bit easier for me. In that if I've got someone coming to me, then it's a little bit like if you go to a doctor and the doctor says, take these tablets three times a week and stop smoking and you know go for a five mile walk every day. If the doctor says it, you'll kind of do it. What I find is if somebody comes to me, I'm known for you know what I do, and if I say do this, they the do chances it. are they might do it. Yeah, it's a bit like <laughs> you go to a gym and a trainer says, okay, here's your program. We work. You say you want to to lose three inches around the waist. Um, here's what we're going to do. You'll do it. So, but the the first step is actually having the courage to stand up and go. Something here's not right, and I need some help. Okay. So that's the first thing. So you don't, I'm not suggesting, and I'm not trying to do some kind of cheesy sale here. You know, you, do, you don't have to go to somebody, but you know, you can buy a, a book and not just my book, any old book. You can buy books for $20. You can do courses at places like Udemy online. You know, you can, there are so many means now by which we can uh, upskill and learn more. And we just need to do it. If you're, 
energy is low and your clarity is cloudy, then we, let's take some action. It's just imagine you're a, a, you know, a potential customer that's walking into a fitness studio. That's the kind of condition they're in. They're coming to you. So now actually put yourself in that position. What are you going to do? What are three things that you can start to do that's going to just clear the fog of it for you? And you know, there are so – you can maybe – buddy up with another couple of people because often once you start to voice this with another couple of business owners maybe it's a networking event or at some kind of coffee catch up you'll find that oh you know what i feel a bit like that too so buddy up with somebody say okay why don't we both work on this together let's meet once a week or talk once a week and let's see if we can't just kind of change the energy around here a bit but the first thing is having the courage to go you know to recognize that something needs to change and once you do that then i think you you know you you're on the way slowly at least okay um i've heard you talk about getting a a coach or an accountability yep. buddy um yep. to help improve your business overall um you know what is that and and wh- wh- where would somebody who's running a fitness business find one of those Okay. Well, look. There's finding a business coach to support you these days is pretty easy. When I when I started coaching in 1999, you know, I, I the way, funny enough, that I had to explain to people who didn't know what coaching was, I say, well, look, you know, you know how a fitness trainer is that person who runs alongside you. I'm kind of like that, but I'm a I'm a business coach, so I will kind of run alongside you in your business. Now that so that was the analogy that I used to to have to explain it. Today, there are so many business coaches out there. So many people are doing it. So you don't have to look terribly far is the answer. If you just Google business coach and the name of your your nearest sort of major city, you will find a lot of business coaches. And business coaches, uh, generally speaking, will give a little bit of their time for free just to make sure that the fit's right. So the... I would suggest to anybody listening who's not done it, you know, again, Google what's it like working with a coach. Just have a look at what some of the discussions are. Uh, You can also Google how, how to find the right coach. There's lots of articles about that. But basically, a coach is someone who will hold you accountable on a weekly, fortnightly, or monthly basis, whatever works for you, um, and will will work with you to to cl- just like a trainer does. Will work with you to work out what are your goals, what are your business goals, what are your personal goals, and will talk with you on a hopefully on a fairly regular basis and work out okay if that's what you want to do, what are three things you're going to do in the next seven days in that direction you know and you will you will say well i'll do this i'll do this i'll do this and the coach say okay when i talk to you next time let's see how you've gone with that and just just that action and i'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it hugely kevin but um in that that just that action of knowing that somebody is kind of watching your corner watching your back if you like um often is the thing that brings about major change you don't have to work with a coach forever but it can absolutely be the thing that can set you on a new path okay so and well worth it. A question though: How do you yes. f- know you have found a good coach? Okay, well that's a good question as well. Um, how you find if you've got a good coach is you should for a, for a start you need to work with somebody who you feel that uh, they are speaking the kind of language that resonates well with you. That they are uh, not sort of too airy fairy and fluffy, but they are actually. Yeah, hopefully they'll have some track record, maybe some testimonials that talk about the work they do. So we need to make sure that you've got someone who actually knows what they're doing. But I think I honestly do believe good old fashioned intuition is extremely useful. Talk to the person, tell them what it, what it is that you're trying to achieve, and then just listen to what they're saying and how they think they're going to do it. So look at their processes. You might also look and see where they've done their training. So for these these days, you know, to call yourself a coach, you don't need to have done anything. So you know, have a look at what what they've done and where they've come from again testimonials really key thing look at testimonials the other thing is just to in a good question to ask a coach is is how will i know that what i'm doing with you is working what measures should we have and then just wait and see what the coach says you know because there should be measures and if you're working with a coach the right coach you will notice and feel change just as you would with a again i keep coming back to personal trainers you know how do you know if you're working with the right personal yeah. trainer well but one way you that you it. do is you start you can feel it and you start to see results the same is true with the coach and if you're going there because you want to re-energize well you should within a couple of sessions start to feel somewhat re-energized so i honestly and the great thing is you're not signing up to some ongoing you shouldn't sign up to some 
big, long, ongoing, expensive contract. You know, keep it simple to start with. Just get a few sessions going, and you'll you will soon know whether the fit is right for you. Okay. Um, okay. I think you gave us some good. Um uh, you know, recommendations there around re-energizing yourself. But tell me, for people who are employing staff, uh, administrative yep. staff, uh, personal or, or trainers, group trainers, personal trainers, how do you go about energizing those people if you feel, you know, things aren't really running at 100%? Okay. Okay. Well, look, the first thing is, and I, and I think this is something that um, every business owner needs to take on the chin, is if you've got a, uh, a number of staff that are uh, low energy, demotivated, then you need to go into the bathroom and look in the mirror. Because staff take their lead from the business owner. So if there is a general sense of low energy within a business, the person at the top is the person I believe that is most responsible for that. So that's the first thing. You need to go and have a good long look at yourself, right? Because if, if people are demotivated, if people are coming up to you kind of sort of demanding more, more money, more time off, more whatever, if they're making those kind of demands, it's because your business and your employment is not satisfying them. It's not giving them enough energy and fulfillment. And that's down to you. So that's the key thing, I think, is if people are uh, low in energy and low in motivation, you need to firstly look at yourself and what are you doing? Because it's often what happens in a business, particularly in a newish business, is in the early days, the sort of uh, hopefully somewhat charismatic, somewhat energetic business owner is kind of always around, bouncing around from here to there, doing all those things. And everybody feeds off that energy. And that's what often create, that's why so many startup businesses are so totally exciting is because they're all centered around an individual or a couple of people yep. and everybody sucks on that energy. What Unfortunately, what happens then is business starts getting busy and that energetic bouncy person is now sitting on a corner staring at a monitor, right? So they, and the, what's happened is the staff have lost that person because yep. they're over there now. They're worrying about, you know, cash flow and, and all that stuff, you know? Now, that's one of the many challenges of running a business um, is how do we how do we juggle all that well that's a great question and we need to look at every business to before we find the answer to that but often if if you are the source of energy and you have been if you've taken yourself out of the picture that's why your staff are demotivated and are feeling a bit flat and so you need to shift that either we need to get you out of the kind of doing of some of the business and back on the floor if you like back doing being yeah. seen, being visible, and that's that's all about delegation and and how you structure your work. And if that's just not possible, then we need to, to some degree, replicate the energy you had with someone else within the business. Yeah. But if you know what again, what often ha will happen with the business that's kind of under some kind of struggle is the business owner will be the person walking around with a very long face, just looking, you know, and the staff will be going, oh, Christ, what's wrong with him today? You know, is that sort of stuff. Once you've got that atmosphere permeating a business, it's not long before everybody just feels miserable. Okay. So, you know, that, I hope that's a bit of a harsh response, but that's, yeah, that's I like it. That, you know, that's where it needs to start is yeah. with the person that runs the business. Cool, okay. Um, I am going to circle back and maybe pin you down sure. a bit more on my, my, yeah, my yeah. very first question. Um, let's okay. say I've had a, a change of mindset, the energy is running through the business. Um, give us some tactics in marketing that people, that you're seeing working across small businesses. Um, what is it that's getting pe more people through the door? What can you leave our listeners with here that will just give okay. them a little bit of inspiration? Okay, perfect, all right. Well, look, there's a couple of things. So I talked a bit about perceived indifference. People leave a business because they think the business doesn't care. So I still, I'm, a, I'm somewhat old school. And that's my belief is people stay with the business absolutely and they talk about a business to other people when they feel confident that the business does care about them. So that shift is a huge one. Now, there is, if you want to absolutely retain customers and grow word of mouth and word of mouth uh, is still, and we know from our research, and I'm sure, Kevin, you'll agree with this, mm -hmm. word of mouth is still by far, by far, 
the major source of new business in just about any small business. And within the fitness industry, it's, it absolutely must be right at the top of the list. It doesn't matter what advertising promotions you do, what really works is when somebody leaves your fitness studio and says to someone else, oh my God, I feel so good, I feel so fit, I feel, feel so energized because of that wonderful place I go to, they're so lovely to me, I can't believe how lovely they are. That's what grows businesses, word of mouth. Now, for people to talk well about your business means you've absolutely should have number one of your list making a fuss of people making a fuss and you will any business owner who's you know got their finger on the pulse will know who the people are in their business who are really supportive of what they do they'll know the customers that really get something from their business now if you if you sit at the again I'm, i'll use a fitness studio example if you're standing at the front counter and you're there and you watch all your customers come in during the course of a week you will i guarantee you you'll recognize four five six or ten of those people who are the people that are the real supporters of what you're doing and does that make sense to you kevin You've yeah it does what that, what, what yeah. do you do with them right. right what you do with them is you you acknowledge that they are such strong supporters and you enroll them in being advocates for you so an advocate or a champion or a raving fan use whatever terms you want those are the people that spread word of mouth but in many cases they don't spread word of mouth because they don't think that you that you need it or that you want it mm -hmm. so what what a lot of businesses will do is they'll do a very sort of carte blanche you know one size fits all promotion you know introduce a new member and we'll give you you know a free towel or or a free water bottle or something so a, just a bog standard promotion that goes to every member and you know those sort of things have a role but the more effective thing to do is gather together the 10 or 20 people that you know are already kind of fans of your business get them together on some special event take them on some special event have a host a barbecue for mm -hmm. them you know when the sun gets start shining do something just for those people and then talk to them and say hey the reason i've got you all here today is because i know that you all really support what we do here you make good use of what we do here and we want more people like you you are the people that are really benefiting from our services, that are, are enjoying a healthier life, are going to live longer. And what we want to do in this business is help more people benefit in the way that you do. And the reason that we've got you here today is to let you know, please, we would like more people like you to come. Here is, you know, here's a gift to acknowledge the great support that you give us. And for the next month, please, we're going to Please bring any guests with you that you feel will benefit from this and we'll make a big fuss of them. Or something, you know, I'm making yeah, that stuff on the I spot. Like it, yeah. But that's the sort of thing. It's to target your message at the people who already get you as opposed to what I call binge marketing, which is where we do a broad message to anybody who'll listen. You know, we spend money on flyers, on radio campaigns, TV ads, magazine ads, you know, largely a waste of money. A lot of them are a waste of money. What yeah. we should be doing is targeting it to the people that already get us and then trying to uh, excite and enroll their support. Because the thing is, uh, Kevin, is that a lot of people that are uh, already kind of supporters of you, they don't actually know that you're looking to grow your business. Because often what we say to them, they, they come in and they go, oh, Kevin, how are you going? And you go, yeah. oh, fantastic, mate, everything's terrific. We tend to do that. Whereas what we can be doing is saying to those people, you know what, everything's terrific, but oh, I could do with another three people like you. You know, when I, <clears throat> when I stand at the front of the class and, and I see you in the room, I know, you know, it just makes me feel so good and, and so many other people are looking at how you exercise and how you train and I can see that they're benefiting from, you know, your commitment. Gosh, I could do with more people like you. That's the kind of language that we should be using, but we don't have, often don't have the courage to do that. So what we end up doing is a fairly bland sort of message that we think is going to everybody, but in fact, is, is, is just ending up in the bin. Yeah, so you're saying the key so, to word of mouth is be selective about who you ask and then make the ask. Yeah, but what, yes, yes, that's right. What, what a lot of biz, small businesses do, and they do this in a, in a <clears throat> I'm sure it doesn't happen much in your industry, but they often do it in a very clumsy way. They will ask people for 
referrals or word of mouth, uh, regardless of where the relationship is. You know, I've yeah. even been to networking events where I meet somebody and a very, I've only known the person for two minutes and they're asking for a referral. All that, that just makes me want to go home and have a shower. You know, it doesn't, that's not good at all. But what, what, what we can do as businesses is just sit down with our key staff and go, right, people, what I want to do here this morning is write a list of all the customers that come in here, all the members that we believe really enjoy coming here and really get something from coming here those people that are engaged with us as a business now you go through that exercise and you end up with a list of 20 people you say right the task for the next week is i want all of you here to really make a super extra big fuss of these people right let's just let them know how much we love them let's say hey dave you're back thank you so much for coming again it's the third time this week you are a legend make a fuss of those people make them feel extra special and then actually do sidle up to them when you can and go, Dave, you know what? It's just so great having you in here. Boy, we could do it with another three or four people yeah. like you. Yeah. You know, that's the way to that's the way to do it. Now there's another thing I'm just gonna go on to, which is if I may go on ahead. similar to yeah, okay. So I'm gonna take us into a different industry, which is the landscape design industry, and I'll okay. explain why in a minute. Right. So in the landscape, you imagine that your job, Kevin, is to design uh, a park for your local community. There's a new piece of land come up and they want you to put a park in there. Now, often what a landscape designer will do, they'll design this park for the council and they'll put the paths in certain locations, you know, uh, near the trees and to the playground and the swings and all that stuff. Then what happens, they open the park the public come into it for the first time and what do they do they tend to ignore some of the walk paths the grass. because they, they walk on the grass and they create a different path because getting from here to there is actually a bugger your path mm. i'm going to walk through the trees it's quicker and what happens is you end up creating a sort of trampled bit of grass and then it t turns into a dirt track anyway those things are called desire lines that's the technical term for those little pathways they're called desire lines that's when the public show you this is the way i want to go i don't want to follow your stupid path now why am i telling you all this well in business there are desire lines in our businesses people are showing us ways that we can improve that often we don't notice so that might be that they um, don't put the used towels in the bin in the corner of, of the changing room. They throw them on a little ledge that happens to be there. Or it might be that they don't park their cars in the way that they want to park them. They park them somewhere else. Or they don't put the dumbbells back where you, you want them to put them. They put them somewhere else. This is your customers. And these are just sort of you know pithy examples. But our customers often show us the changes that we should be making to our business. But what we tend to do as business owners frequently is we'll go, we'll go tut, 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 you know, and go, no, no, don't put that there, put that there. You know, we will try and keep people doing things the way we want yeah. whereas often what we can do and this is very this can often help us in marketing our businesses is look at what your customers are doing if they're not coming to your 5 a.m class but they're queuing for your 7 a.m class you know then that's a desire line they're showing you you know forget the five o'clock let's let's get maybe do one at six o'clock you know whatever there, there are our customers often show us the course that we should take but if we're not careful in our businesses, we ignore those desire lines. You know, another very common way is how people use your website. How are they booking? How are they traversing through your website? What are they clicking on? You know, and oft we can get a lot of these stats from our analytics is we yeah. just should have a look. What are our customers showing us that maybe we're ignoring? And again, these are sort of this might not be sort of this kind of response you're expecting when you ask me about marketing tactics. But often the solution to marketing is a lot closer than we think. Often it is, as I said to you, talking about customers that really do understand us and kind of re-energizing them to talk more about us. It is also having a look at how customers are behaving and what they're doing and seeing if by shifting a few things, we can create more of that. So marketing, I think a mistake, and I spent a large part of my, my um, sort of 30s or well, all through my 30s working in the marketing industry marketing in in you know when i was in when i was a marketing consultant i would make it sound very highfalutin and very you know so i could charge you higher fees um to do all sorts of marketing work for you marketing is actually at its heart is simple marketing is putting the right thing in front of the right person at the right time 
you know that's there's, there's no great science in marketing really we marketing consultants make it sound difficult to say because they can charge you more but basically if we look at what our customers are already doing if we look at the habits of people then you know that's what we can how we can benefit so i'm just gonna i'm jumping around but let me give you another example so we talked before about customers in your uh, fitness center that are the people that get you well if we're doing if we're very active on social media and we want to put video content on social media, then the people that we should be talking about or interviewing are those people, the people that really get us. Mm -hmm. So a great thing that I've seen a business do recently, not in your industry, but in a, in a different industry, was they would they picked out the people that they know really get it, and just as that person's about to leave, they jump out in front of them with, yep. a, with a smartphone and go, David, how was your session this morning? What did you get from it? And that's all they say. And then they just listen. David go, oh, that was brilliant. As usual, I've got so much. I can't wait to get off to work now. I feel those are meaningful. Yep. Those are brilliant. They're said by somebody. You know, that's the kind of stuff that we should be doing to spread the message. And I'll yep. get the people that are already your fans to talk about you. Far yep. better that than some stilted staged video by somebody who really doesn't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, that's what people want to watch. And I think that's overall, yeah. I think that's that's a lot of food for thought okay listen uh, robert like this has been fantastic wish we could stay longer um before i let you go tell me about your new book the one minute commute okay. and sure. just tell me how people can get in touch because i'm sure there's going to be some people maybe down in australia who want to talk and uh, learn a bit more from you yeah sure thank you well look so the, the one minute commute uh, and then the title is you know suggesting that it might be a home-based business and the commute is from your you know your living room to your front mm. room so it's it's but it's not just about running a home-based business it's about running a small business designed the way you want it totally on your terms and what i talk about in that book is basically what i've learned through following this 120,000 odd community speaking with them talking with them and it's kind of everything I know about working in a very small business so um, it I go through a lot of marketing I talk a lot about productivity how to actually you know work efficiently and effectively I talk a lot about sort of staying motivated and upbeat so it's all the kind of stuff I've, uh, I've been speaking about today and you know I'm working on my next book now which will basically be about rekindle about how we keep the flame alive so certainly uh, my book the one minute commute you can buy online at Amazon and various other places um, it's just the one minute commute uh, and there's also an audio book version uh, on audible.com so you can listen to me droning on for about seven hours um, and uh, and so I'd love people certainly to check that out uh, if they listen to podcasts then rekindle is on you know Apple podcasts and Google podcasts and wherever you get your podcasts and basically all of the stuff that I do is on my website which is robertgerish.com so that's g-e-r-r-i-s-h robertgerish.com please um pop by say hello any questions you got you know hit me up and uh, you know i love what i do i hope it comes across in what i do and uh it's it's just been terrific to speak with you kevin so thank yeah. you so much thank you very much i think all our listeners are gonna be delighted with that thank you very much and hopefully we chat again soon okay thank you all the best